Morning, everybody. Morning. Morning. All right, thanks for having us here. We're really excited to talk to you a little bit today about grit, but quick uh, introduction first for ourselves. Um, like Mike said, I'm Brian, this is Mike, and we're the co-founders of Cellbrite, and most of our team is over here too, so you can say hi to them. Um, and quickly, Cellbrite is a software solution for retailers to help them manage and build and grow their multi-channel e-commerce uh, business. Um, we're not gonna get too much into that right now, that's not what this presentation's about, but if you guys wanna talk to us about that afterwards, we're happy to talk, or any of our team can talk about it, hopefully. Um, and a, a quick shout out to Mike Schaefer, who invited us to talk today and uh, let us talk about something other than e-commerce for the first time, which is a, a welcome change. So really appreciate that, Mike. So, um, you know, we put something together. It might be a little chaotic, but hopefully you can <laughs> relate to it and enjoy it. So we're here today not to talk about grits. That's, that's not what this is. Uh, I'm actually from LA, so I don't even know what grits are. My North Carolina, uh, born and raised. Or, Southern or raised, raised, so I'll probably talk to you about grits I later. Talk to you about grits. <laughs> now we're here to to talk about grit. So if you don't know what grit is, the definition is a blend of passion and perseverance for very long-term goals. Um, we didn't make this definition up ourselves. There's actually an expert on grit uh, by the name of Dr. Angela Duckworth. She literally wrote the book on grit, which came out in May. Uh, it's a really good book. Um, but that's her definition of grit. And she's a psychologist um, and an expert in grit and self-discipline. So actually really interesting stuff. Um, but she gave the definition uh, that we showed here, the passion and pers perseverance for a very long-term goal. And we'll get into that a little bit more here in a bit. But she also says grit is having st stam stamina. It's also sticking with your future day in and day out, not just for the week, not just for the month, but for years on end. So we're talking long-term stuff, you know, uh, not just a project here and there that you uh, abandon after a while. It's also working really hard to make your future a reality. And grit is living life like a marathon, not a sprint. And that's really what we're gonna talk a lot about today um, with our company and how um, we've gotten to where we are today. Now. Quick disclaimer, we don't claim to be to know everything. <laughs> We're still learning, our company is still very young and growing, um, but we have experienced a lot of obstacles like every entrepreneur has, and so that's what we wanna share today and talk about how we feel like grit is one of the um, key traits that an entrepreneur needs to be successful. What we do know, though, is that it takes more than just grit. We're not saying that grit is all it takes to be successful. Um, it definitely takes more. It actually takes a good idea. So you have to have a good idea to be a successful entrepreneur. And you have to have a market for that idea, somebody that's willing to buy it. You have to have customers. Obviously, you know, should go without saying that these two things are important. But it also takes time, and a lot of time, and that kind of goes into grit and the perseverance part of it. It also takes timing. So we were part of Idea Lab Incubator here, and Bill Gross, the founder, actually did a really good TED Talk on how he thinks timing is one of the most important um, elements of a successful startup and evaluating the companies that have come in and out of uh, Idea Lab. And it actually does take some money. So, you know, we haven't raised a ton of money, and we'll get into that as well. Um, but it does take a little bit of money to get going, just to file paperwork to get your business going and maybe to build the product and, and things like that. And of course, it also takes a little bit of luck. So, and probably a million other things that we haven't mentioned here. So it is more than just grit, but we feel like, and Dr. Duckworth feels that grit is the key trait that every uber successful entrepreneur must have. So, <clears throat> our company, Cellbrite, I introduced it a little bit, but like I said, we've been through, um, we've been running the company now since, uh, well, the idea started in late, 2011, and we kind of got going in late 2011, early 2012, and put some money together. Um, Mike pretty much gave me all his savings, and, and we got this company going, um, and worked on some ideas, but we're gonna go through some of the early um, struggles and, and uh, obstacles that we ran into, and just talk through those a little bit. And really, it's kind of open the book to you guys and share that um, we know everybody is struggling as, a, as an entrepreneur in the early days, it's really hard. Um, and just to let you know that you can get through it and this is how we got through it, this is our story. So first, before we get into that, Mike's gonna jump into it in a sec, but quick
quick show of hands, who here is an entrepreneur that's in the early stages, maybe just an idea or just getting going, just building your product? Anybody in that stage? Yeah, awesome, cool. So hopefully this will be pretty relevant to you guys. So I'm gonna let Mike take over here and talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we've had early on. The early days of Cellbrite. So uh, this screenshot, it's the same shirt. Well, not the same shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I think I still have that shirt too. Um, this screenshot is from an early video we did when we were uh, completely clueless and looking for a little bit of help to build our first prototype of our product. Um, the early days, Cellbrite started like many tech companies in a living room. Um, we had the idea to build solutions for what we knew, which was e-commerce. Um, we both had full-time jobs, so we would come home after work, plan out our product, figure out you know how it was going to be the best thing in the world, how it was going to beat every other product out there, uh, and then realize, okay, we got a lot of work ahead of us. But how are we going to do this? Um, well. Like Brian said, we scraped together everything that we could uh, and built a prototype. Now, we didn't have a whole lot of money, so our prototype was really only about one-tenth of the product that we ultimately wanted to build. But that's all that we could actually put together. So we thought we could get this thing built in maybe a month, maybe two. Six months later, we had a prototype built uh, that was very raw. Um, and in that time, we were actually working with uh, developers in India uh, and I don't know if anybody here has experience uh, working with Indian development, um, but it was actually a, a great experience, uh, but the hours are a little bit different. <laughs> so you're basically working all night because you're 12 hours ahead and they want to get started in the morning. So we're talking, you know, full-time job during the day, come home, do some work at night, work with your developers pretty much for the rest of the evening, um, and then get your product launched. So once we had our prototype, uh, we thought, this is it, we've got everything we need, let's go and uh, show some investors what we can do uh, and get on the path to start building the product that we ultimately wanted. Maybe this is going to take us two to three months to do. We're feeling pretty confident and people have already shown that they like our product. This is our uh, living room, but, or my yeah. living room at the time, by the way, which also doubled as my roommate's office. So all this crap in the back is from my roommate's Yeah, there were two companies in about a uh, 10 <laughs> A lot of our nights, though, in the beginning, you know, working, you guys may experience this now if you have full-time jobs, but there's no other time to work on your business besides at night when you're already exhausted and you're ready to just want to go to bed or watch TV or have a cocktail or something like that. And that's when you really need to push yourself and have that discipline to keep going and have that perseverance. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about how you get that at the end of this thing, but, um, you know, Mike and I, having a co-founder helps because you can push each other and keep each other going. Um, but that's what we did every night, 7 to 10 p.m., and then work with the Indian developers from 10 to 2 a.m., and then wake up and go to work in the next morning. So I know it's, uh, we're not a, the only ones that are doing this. A lot of you guys have done this, but um, just, you know, that, that's, what has, that's what you have to do sometimes to get going and, and get the company off down. And we couldn't build our own product. You know, we didn't have the luxury of having the skills to do it ourselves. So that was by nature what we had to endure. Um, so launch our prototype, two to three months maybe, get some funding, and then start hiring to build the product that we dreamed of. About a year later, <laughs> we actually had enough money to hire our first employee. Um, so that was you know, an additional 12 months after spending six months trying to put our prototype together. Uh, still working full-time jobs, still coming home at night and trying to market with a little prototype that we had to show that we could grow it, to show that it was going to you know, really be a game-changing product and, and you know, disrupt our industry, to use a, a terrible cliche. Um, but that's what we did, and uh, we got through it. We were able to raise a little bit of money from Idea Lab here in Pasadena. Um, we're local Pasadena uh, you know, entrepreneurs. We had learned about e-commerce here in Pasadena. Um, so you know, this is very much our community, and it's incredible to hear the awesome stories of uh, satisfaction from your clients that you guys shared this morning. Um, that's honestly the best part of what we do as well, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more too, even in the face of a product that maybe not, is not working quite as well as you would hope. Um, so, fundraising. This is actually a chart of our growth since June of 2014. 
Uh, in June 2014, we officially launched the Cellbrite product to the market. Not our prototype, but the product that we wanted. Now granted, it was still probably only a third of what it is today, because there was a lot more functionality that we needed to add. Um, but we had raised a little bit of money, we were able to hire a team. Uh, our team consisted of uh, Brian and I and two other gentlemen, one of which is here. <laughs> I'm going to talk about you in a minute, so I'm not getting off the end <laughs> But we actually did okay. We launched our product, and it started growing, and we thought, all right, now we're going to go out and we're going to raise a little bit more money. We're going to hire more people. We're going to be able to invest in marketing instead of just writing about e-commerce on our blog, which has worked well for us, but we want to do more. So we went out and we had meetings. Unfortunately, with Idea Lab, we, they have a lot of great connections, so we met some incredible investors. We uh, you know, got around Los Angeles and talked to a lot of really intelligent and well-connected and respected people that had great things to say. And even before you get into that, the Idea Lab part itself took a long time. So Mike alluded to, you know, we thought we were going to have this, our whole funding seed round wrapped up in the summer. Crazy to think now. Um, and that didn't happen. We were way too early. We didn't have enough traction at all to appeal to any of the VCs in town. Although they were interested in what we're doing, but not for an investment purpose. Um, and we got lucky, really, and um, had the opportunity to meet with uh, Idea Lab, Tom McGovern from Idea Lab, through a connection. Isabel mentioned that network is uh, super important, which we agree. So there was a connection through our attorney that introduced us to Idea Lab, and we pitched to them. And even that process, we met them in December uh, 2012, and that process took almost six months. And they made us prove out our concept even more. So they gave us a little bit of money to begin with and made us prove it out um, through some lean startup kind of, uh, if you're not familiar with that, look it up, but um, through some lean startup kind of methods that we had to prove out that there was a demand for what we were building. And then they finally gave us the rest of the check, which was uh, super helpful. I and mean, we'll always be grateful to Idea Lab for that. But the process took forever. And it took you know over a year from when we thought when we started and when we thought we were going to raise money in three months, it took over a year to get it done. And at one point, I had even quit my job. I was working full time. Before we even got the confirmation from Idea Lab, uh, I gave three weeks notice. And on the last day of my job, we got the call from Idea Lab that they were going to invest. <laughs> uh, so that was pretty close. Uh, but that was even just a little bit of money that they were going to give. So Mike stuck it out at his job for another month or so, and then once we proved out, and they said they were gonna give the rest, and Mike quit his job too and, and joined. So um, that's where that little bit of luck part comes in, but uh, but it is you know the sticking with it and uh, the perseverance through that whole thing. Right, and which then just kicked off really a never-ending process of continuing to try to bring in more resources into the company. Yeah. So throughout the next year and a half, we have gone out to raise money and brought in some money to help grow our team. Um, and if you want to get a look at what our uh, investor log looks like, where we've recorded all of our, our meetings and all of our, our dealings with every investor that we've ever met with, this is actually a snapshot of it. Uh, and you'll see there's a lot of red, uh, where uh, that indicates that somebody said no. And there's actually some green and some yellow, and those should actually also be red, because those are all no's as well. <laughs> at some point, we just stopped updating the sheet, so it uh, lost its purpose. Um, but uh, this is not even a complete list. Um, the point being that you know we have struggled to, even with a product that's growing, even with uh, an idea that we think is almost ahead of its market in like the perfect way. When Brian said timing earlier, we're right in, in the right spot at the right time. Uh, it's still incredibly difficult to raise money. So if anybody is trying to raise money and you're struggling and you're getting a lot of no's and you're getting some really almost uh, insulting no's, like you have no idea what you're doing, or this is small ball, or um, you're never gonna be successful. Uh, don't give up, because we've heard those things before as well. Hiring. I absolutely love this GIF, by the way. Yeah. Um, we have been fortunate to hire an incredible team. Um, right Thanks. And a lot of our team is here. Thank you. Um, uh, our first hire was actually our uh, chief technology officer, Homan, who uh, decided he, he said that he would help us out um, about 15 months after we first asked him when he said, no, I'm not interested. Uh, back when we were working out of our living room. 
um, and uh, we're very appreciative. Um, we uh, Homan joined us in July of 2013, and um, about two days later, he came into the office with another guy who uh, he said, "Oh, hey guys, by the way, this is so and so, and he's going to be working with us." <laughs> and we kind of looked at each other like, oh, "Okay, well, I guess we're a team of four now." <laughs> um, and uh, you know, that was our team. We built uh, Cellbrite. We built the product for about a year before we launched it. Uh, in uh, June of 2014, and um, we were operating very lean. You know, it was just the four of us. We were paying ourselves, you know, just enough to live, really. Um, and uh, then, about six months after the launch, um, that team member who had helped us build a lot of the product, uh, right as we were coming into the holiday season, which in retail is like peak craziness season. Uh, and all of your customers and all retailers are starting to lock things down and brace for the holidays. Um, that team member left us. And uh, it was kind of scary because we didn't really know what we were going to do. Um, but uh, we kept going. We looked for some more help. And we brought somebody else on board who then also left us about six weeks later. Um, and it was a little frightening. We thought, are we going to be able to hire people? Uh, is there something wrong with what we're doing? Is there something wrong with how we are you know, managing our team, um, with uh, how we talk about you know, what it is we want to do? Are we not being inspiring enough? Uh, not to mention also super expensive to lose people, to hire people and lose them. The time loss of having to go find somebody else and train them and bring them up. I mean, it felt like we were going backwards at that point. Yeah, incredibly expensive. Um, and. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so we said, you know, let's make sure that we focus a lot on our recruiting. We need to spend a lot of time with anybody that's going to join us, particularly this early. Um, and uh, we were able to hire a few more people. Um, and we haven't had really any such disasters. Good. Not a question. Not a question? Okay. Um, we've been fortunate to build a great team, and basically my point is that you know sometimes it's really really difficult to get started. You have doubts, um, but if you can identify where you're weak and you can get stronger, you can pull through it. Um, and that includes you know sometimes having to let go of people, which is almost the worst thing to do because uh, you feel again like maybe you did something wrong, maybe you're second guessing your abilities, um, but you got to fight through that. All right, so. That oh shit moment that every tech entrepreneur has had. Um, going back to the retail season, six months after launch, right coming into the peak of the holidays, our product, for lack of a better word, completely broke and stopped working. <laughs> One of the core pieces of automation behind it really stopped working. We didn't really know it for sure, but we were pretty sure that it was broken. But our product was so young that we didn't even have enough reporting internally to see if there was an issue going on. So for a week, we were kind of like trying to fix it, and then we'd get more complaints. And then we'd try to fix, and then we'd get more complaints. To the point where we were straight up hamster wheeling our software, manually going in and operating it for our customers until we could get it resolved. That, that lasted about a month. And we thought we were going to lose the whole company. This was only three or four months after we launched and started generating revenue. So at this we were in our revenues, you know, in the 20K or 30K a month, which it was okay, but uh, you know, a couple months of, of, of losing customers or a couple days of losing customers, and that's gone, and we're out of business. So it was a super scary moment. Yeah, um, but we got through it, and we learned that uh, yes, we lost some customers, but a lot of our customers were just so thankful that we were there helping them, and they actually appreciated other things about our company than some of the things that our product did. It made us realize that there is a lot of value in just being there for your customers and helping them. And, uh, and the, the value that you get back from your customer and, and that appreciation is just incredible. It's what keeps you going. Um, we, uh, okay, so we operated out of a living room for a year and a half. And then we moved into Idea Lab, which is kind of like being in your parents' basement. Uh, and we were there for about three years. So a year and a half into Idea Lab, we're thinking it's really time for us to figure out who we are. We need our own space to start building our identity, start building the culture that we want. Um, so we had started looking for an office. And uh, we found a lot of really great offices that we couldn't afford or uh, that wouldn't allow us to apply because we were just going to be too small and they knew it was going to be a waste of their time. 
Um, and we finally did find an office, and we got so excited about it, we brought the whole team, and we were all very creepily looked through the windows to see if this was going to be it. Everyone was super fired up, and we applied, and it looked like it was going to be fantastic, and they said, thank you for applying, but we're going to actually give the office to Ben Affleck's little brother. And he was kind of like, fucking Ben Affleck. So we lost that office. Uh, and we kept looking, and we, we said, screw it, we'll just stay in Idea Lab in our little pod that was uh, pretty much over the legal limit of how many people we could fit into it. Um, and then one day, Brian said, let's start looking again. And about two days later, we came across our current office that happened to be, have everything that we needed, space for us to grow into, agreeable terms. It's in the back of a bar. <laughs> Seriously, we subleased from a bar. Uh, so, and it's amazing. And I couldn't be happier, and I think our team couldn't be happier to be there. And you know, it was a long process, and it, it, uh, you know, there were a lot of heartbreak moments when we thought we were going to finally find a home, but it worked out. Felt like we we're n no knock on Idea Lab, because again, it's awesome, but we felt like we we're going to be at Idea Lab forever. We thought we would be there three, maybe six months, and it took three years for us to get out. Hmm. Quickly, I want to talk about the octopus, because we get a lot of people that ask, why did you choose an octopus? Now, there are pretty obvious parallels to what we do. Um, we are a multi-channel e-commerce solution, so you know, there is kind of multiple arms controlled by one brain. Uh, an octopus is highly intelligent. Um, and, uh, but there are some more subtle uh, nuances to the octopus. Uh, an octopus is a very sentient creature. They're believed to have individual personalities, and there are studies that show uh, multiple octopus playing with different toys and playing with them in different ways. Uh, an octopus has three hearts. I don't know if anybody knew that. Uh, and um, they are incredibly resilient. Um, but even further, when we were putting together this presentation, you know, one of the things that I think is really embodied in our logo, an octopus is incredibly resilient. Um, they can lose a limb and regrow it. They can escape uh, by fitting through impossibly small cracks and crevices. Um, and uh, you know, I think that speaks to um, stick to and uh, you know, the strength to fight through uh, difficult trying times. So, do you have grit? Yeah, it's okay. You, you do the center. So, um, tying this all up, because I know we're a little short on time here. Um, so, we gave some of our examples of, of the obstacles and everything that we've gone through, and and our grit that we have, and, and what's helped us get through all those things. But a lot of people wonder, do you have grit? Well, fortunately, Dr. Duckworth the expert put together uh, a test that you can take, a self-evaluation to see if you have grit or what level you have grit. It's called the Grit Scale. It's available on our website. And she breaks it down into, she has like an eight, 10, and a 12 question version, but breaks it down into questions related to passion and questions related to perseverance. So we have a few examples here of some of the questions. Um, it's really more statements, and then you answer whether you strongly disagree or strongly agree as they are related to yourself. Um, and then you get a score at the end. Um, so I encourage you all to check it out and see how gritty you are. Uh, Mike and I fall in about the four and a half point range, which is pretty gritty. Um, but things like new ideas and projects sometimes distract me from previous ones. So if, that, if you agree with that, that would actually be a reverse score, right? So that would be a low score if you agree with that. And on the perseverance side, you know, I finish whatever I begin or setbacks don't discourage me, things like that. So. She's used this scale um, to prove through scientific studies that grit is one of the most important trade, uh, more, most important traits or, or factors in um, success. And so she studied cadets at West Point and how uh, she uh, measures them before their boot camp and then looks at the ones who finish boot camp, which has a really high churn rate, and figures out that the ones that make it through are, have, typically have higher grit scores than the ones who fail out. Same thing with the National Spelling Bee with children and the ones that finish there. Same thing with sales teams at major companies, corporations. The ones that are best performing typically have high grit scores. And she even looks at it in terms of age and um, college education. And interestingly, the higher degree that you have, you get all the way up into a doctorate degree, the higher your grit score. Um, the one outlier, which I thought was interesting, was um, an associate's degree is actually a higher grit score than a bachelor's degree. Mm. And she thinks that's because there's such a high dropout rate of junior colleges that the ones who actually do make it through are super gritty and, and, uh, and have high grit scores. So you can take your test there, but the question really is how do you become more gritty? How do you have grit? Well, Dr. Duckworth, Duckworth has a few points here and we have our own. So she says, first of all, interest. You have to 
this kind of relates to the passion part of it. You have to have an interest in something. So go out and find your interest. Try different things. If you don't already have a passion, hobby, or, or job, or something like that, try different things. She also talks about substituting nuance for novelty. So if you're the type of person that bounces around from different ideas and trying different things, that doesn't get you very far. So instead, dive deep into one idea. Learn new things about that idea and try to go deeper and become more interested in one particular idea. Practice, and particularly deliberate practice, on, uh, on that new interest and in, in idea that you have. So getting out there and forcing yourself to practice it. It's kind of like the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hour thing to, begin, to be an expert at anything. Um, get out there and, and make sure you're continuing to practice and pushing yourself. And find purpose. So purpose beyond just self-purpose, but how does your work or your hobby relate and connect to other people? Is there some kind of meaning to what you're doing to the greater world? Some things are more obvious, like if your passion is to cure cancer, obviously that has uh, significant meaning. Um, but some things are not so obvious, and so you need to find that connection. And finally, hope, which he says you need to have from beginning to end, which is having that positivity and knowing that you can um, keep going and uh, make decisions when things don't go your way and, um, and have an effect and, and be able to keep going on that. But we also have a few other tips that we've learned along the way. One of them is to appreciate the small wins. So that's something we try to do with our team now and, and to celebrate small milestones. Um, you know, we all, our next big milestone is to get to $10 million of revenue. It's gonna take a while to get there, but we're gonna celebrate in, you know, all the little milestones along the way and do things together as a team and, and appreciate those things. And then also to recognize the silver lining, which is hard in the moment for sure, but once you get past the moment when things don't go your way, look back and try to appreciate uh, the silver lining and, and why something didn't go your way. We have a million of those that we look back now and be like, oh, God, thank God we didn't get an investment from that person. <laughs> and then finally, believe in yourself. And I encourage you all to do that. We're all, we have wonderful networks, we have wonderful resources. Any one of us could be a successful entrepreneur. Um, but you have to really believe in yourself and these other things will fall into place as well. So we'll leave you here with a quote from Mario Andretti and then I believe we will open it up to questions. Thank you. Thank you so much guys for sharing that story. I think we can all agree here, it's really interesting to hear from entrepreneurs their struggles, overcoming those challenges, but it's really cool to see that happening locally in our own you know, Old Town Pasadena, I think that's just really awesome. And I think we all just relate to those adversities and, and having grit and being able to persevere in the face of opposition is so important because it actually builds character and helps build better products and services. So awesome, kudos to you guys. You. We're gonna open it up for, uh, for Q&A. John's gonna walk around with the mic. If you have a question, raise your hand, we'll get it answered. If you wanna share a story or just chat, we're gonna do that offline. Will you guys hang out for a little bit so we can? Okay, cool. So if you guys wanna share stories, please save that for later, thanks. Hi. Hi. Um, you mentioned at the beginning that the um, grit, the definition of grit is pursuit of a long-term goal. Right. What you showed us here is a lot of little wins on a path, but not any time during your talk did you talk about what is your long-term goal. So I, maybe you could address that. Yeah, interesting, yeah. Thanks for that. Um, you know, our goal is to build the best multi-channel e-commerce solution out there in terms of the product and dominate the market uh, in terms of that. But we also want to build a culture and an environment that our team loves coming to every day that are where they're inspired um, and challenged to try to be the best versions of themselves that they can be and, and pursue their passions um, over time. Um, so those are, you know, we're, we're still kind of building those things. We're building the product and, and trying to dominate the market as, as best we can. Um, but we're also trying to build this environment and this culture that leads to other entrepreneurs. And when will you know when you achieve that? That's a good question. If uh, the goal is something you can achieve, right? When will you, what, what would the criteria? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, uh, we're not recognized as the number one solution for e-commerce. Yeah, so I would say we have a ways to go. Um, oh, this guy's on. Yeah. Okay. Um, but for us, you know, Brian kind of mentioned this. We both have kind of a builder mindset where we like to create. 
We want to create uh, a company that has value. Most importantly, a product that has value for uh, and creates value for other businesses. We've been on the other side of the fence. So, you know, if we know that we're building a solution that delivers value, then we can take that and escalate that and try to solidify it as the best product in our space. Now, what is our, our goal with the company? Where do we want to take it? We talk about that every day. Yeah. You know, that's kind of an all evolving conversation, but it all starts with creating something of value. And, and I think with any business or entrepreneur or anything like that, that there really is no end, right? There, there's a goal that it's not like, okay, well, we did it, I guess we go home now. You know, it's you hit a certain milestone or you hit a goal that you want and then you set a bigger goal for yourself. So you're always, for us at least, we're always chasing a next goal. And for us, you know, like I mentioned, our current goal is to get to that $10 million revenue mark. So we're chasing that. We'll know when we hit that and then we we'll go on from there. Next question back here. Uh, my name is Kevin Hopkins. I've got a software idea. I'd love to walk away from this meeting today with a, a mentor who can help me with my project. So see me after this. Uh, the um, question I have for you guys, I'm sure you, your idea for your business keeps evolving. Right? Um, but how do you find each other? And where did you find this current business plan growing? How long did that take? Great question. Um, Brian and I met because uh, he was on a team of people that interviewed me when I joined the company here in Pasadena where I cut my teeth at e-commerce. Um, we became friends pretty much from day one uh, and uh, both shared a passion or, or a desire to build a SaaS solution, build a services solution. It just uh, it was a relatively new concept and seemed like a really fun type of product to be behind. Now. Um, the idea for Cellbrite came from our experience in e-commerce, uh, from two different paths. So Brian was in charge of expanding that retailer's presence onto multiple sales channels and managing those technical integrations. Um, my responsibility was I was a buyer and a merchant, so I was responsible for buying product and selling it. And I realized that much more of my business was being spread onto these marketplaces. So between the need for that type of solution and the challenge that, it, that was behind trying to build it, and the fact that there weren't very good solutions available, we said, well, fuck this, we're going to build one ourselves. <laughs> um, could you share more of what you learned from taking investments? Uh, I mean, did taking some of the seed rounds uh, make it more difficult when you get rent for larger investments, et cetera? Yeah, so our fundraising path has been a little bit um, non-traditional. Well, maybe. So we started with Idea Lab as our initial investment. And then since then, we've only raised money from angel investors. So we don't have an institutional VC investment in the company. Um, we've raised about $1.1 million total. Um, and so I guess the suggestions I would make is um, I can make technical suggestions like uh, whether to use convertible notes and things like that early on, but um, you know, we took the Idea Lab money because we needed it and we didn't have a big network at the time and it was relatively expensive money, meaning on the equity side, but it got us to where we are today. So um, I would say, you know, if you can find friends and family and raise that kind of money first and do it on convertible notes that convert later, so you don't have to set evaluation early. That's probably the best way to go. Um, and then, you know, typically with later stage investors, um, they see those kinds of things. So it hasn't been an issue when it's come to raising more money in terms of how we raise money previously. Can I answer your question? Okay. Hi, Pat, Pat Holmes with the Pasadena Angels. The first, the very first question asked you if you had specific criteria for success, and you talked about moving the company forward, but there is a tension between planning and building, a, or, or just you know, just do it versus how much methodology you deploy or how scientific you are. And I'm curious if you're following Lean Startup methodology or if there are any other methodologies or books that inform your uh, building of the company. Yeah, very much so. Um, you know, Ideal Lab, we keep going back to Ideal Lab, but they, They've been doing this whole lean startup thing for 20 years. That's how Bill Gross built that infrastructure where he puts a little bit of money into something to 
see if there's any interest in product market fit, and then if there is, and you get some evidence, then you invest more. So they made us do that too. We had they gave us a, a little bit of money where we had we built kind of like what they talk about in Eric Reese's book too, where they built a website that the product wasn't even there yet, but we put up a pricing page and we tried to put a little bit of money into marketing to see how many people we could get, how many people would who would pick which price, track all that. And um, and then tell them that okay now you can sign up for the beta waiting list. So we did that in the beginning, and we still kind of do things like that today, where we will um, either talk to customers, um, of course, and, and see what they're interested in if there's a market for something. Um, we've sort of been forced to do that because of our minimal funding, and because the funding has come over a long period of time. We haven't had millions of dollars all at once hit our bank account where we could just go build. So we've always had to operate in a very bootstrappy kind of way. Thank, which, thank goodness. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which forces us to really be methodical and do one thing, really one thing at a time and, and um, test it out before we spend a ton of money on anything. Uh, time for one more question. Okay. Uh, by the way, great presentation. Thank you. Um, Jacob Guerra here from uh, Louisiana. I've lived here for 14 days. Nice. Welcome. <laughs> and, uh, I, I'm not moving. The weather's too good. Stick with it. Yeah. You need grit to live in LA, so I can see that. We're in the freeways. Yeah, and, and the traffic flow is pretty wild. Yeah, so um, my, my big problem is I have an app I want to develop. And my big problem I'm coming across is evaluating developers. You know, because every developer I talk to, they say, yeah, I can do that for you. And so what, what questions do you ask your developers to make sure they can fit in with, with your business uh, concept, your business idea, mm -hmm. to have them you know, actually do it properly? That's a good question. You should probably talk to our CTO afterwards to get the true answer. We were fortunate to have worked with Holman at the company that we worked at together, um, CPO Commerce is what it's called. Um, so we knew him early on, so it was easy for us to know. And he built some of those integrations for us at CPO, so we knew we already knew what we needed to be done, and, and we trusted him. Um, and then he's really helped evaluate our engineers as we hire them. But nowadays, we actually give them a little project to do um, to see if they can do it and what you know, the quality is, um, which is, you know, he's at home and put together. So, um, but, um, you know, early on, we did use some freelance developers as well. And we asked, I'm trying to think back how we evaluated them, I think we asked just to see other projects that they did. If there's anything kind of similar to what you're doing in terms of, you know, it's a mobile app or whatever they were able to execute. Um, we look at that kind of even with our um, engineers or designers or anything, you know, okay, Christian's here on our designer seat. You know, you can be a designer that just does marketing stuff, or you can be a designer that does interface, web application interface. And just because you're good at one doesn't mean you're good at the other. So look for um, similar kinds of projects that they've done to what you're trying to build, even if it's not the same app, obviously, but have they done apps like that? Um, you know, if it integrates with something else, look for those kind of key elements, I would say. But talk to Bowman afterwards, he can probably give you a more specific answer. Excellent. Thank you guys so much for your questions.